you for allowing me to present today. And happy St. Patrick's Day. I am based in Ireland. So, as I, as, uh, because I'm in Ireland, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. So, my name is St. John Harold, and I'm the, by profession, the head of information security for a multinational architectural and engineering consultancy organization called PM Group. But for this presentation, I will be sort of speaking in a personal capacity. So just to give a brief overview of who I am, I've got 20 years in the information security industry. I've been working in government, in military and in commercial sectors. I've even led teams that develop open source software. Uh, and, and hence, I'm a big fan of this open source software community. But today, what I want to do is share my thoughts on using open source software within an enterprise. So this is based on the work that myself uh, with Reza and Jules uh, from, from previous uh, presentation earlier, uh, and with a host of other colleagues, we've been working together uh, in a collaborative way in an ad hoc working group for one of the BSI committees, RM1. And in that committee, uh, or within that ad hoc working group, uh, we've been looking at the, the, the specific risks associated with uh, an enterprise using uh, the open source software. Uh, we've now uh, joined forces with IST33 uh, who, from, from BSI, who are responsible for the, the, the 27,000 uh, framework. And uh, we're looking to implement uh, a, a, a standard for open source software uh, in, into, into that framework. We're at very early stages there at the moment. We're, we're still exploring. And this presentation is all about the work that myself and Reza have been doing uh, with, with, with our colleagues, including Ajit. So if there's anything in this presentation that intrigues you or um, uh, prompts you to want to join us, then do please feel free to reach out to us and uh, feel free to or, either myself or to Reza. We can certainly invite you into our group. So during this presentation, what, what I want to cover are the following areas. Just a very, very brief overview of what open source is. And I think you has probably uh, far more experience and, and, and better explanation around the, so the origins of open source software. Uh, and, and, and then I wanted to point out the subtle differences between what I talk about compliance and when I talk about security, because that there are nuances in, in, in those expressions which we, we, we probably want to, to understand further. And then I'll move on to the main discussion, which will be around what open source, about the actual open source risks um, that we've been sort of looking at and exploring through this uh, through this work that we've been doing. And then finally, I'll just give uh, a very brief overview of what our next steps will be in, with regard to uh, the development of the standard that we're looking to do. I'll also just say that, there's, that there is a lot of overlap in what I'm saying, in what um, Gilles has said and what James has said. So forgive me if I do repeat myself in certain areas, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, is, is probably ex extract out more detail around the risks associated with the yeah, open source software. I also want to say that whilst I'm talking about the risks, I am, I'm, I'm not going to explore what the opportunities are. Again, I think they've been covered off earlier uh, and, and those opportunities to using open source software are, are, are extreme, extremely clear uh, and, and very beneficial. But again, from an organizational perspective, uh, but from an enterprise perspective, we still need to be able to have a mechanism by which we can assess the risks. And that's what this is all about. So, as Gio said earlier, the open source community uh, sort of originated in response to uh, the, the, the fact that the original software was in a closed format. And the artifacts that were created, they were pre-compiled binaries or, or executable programs. And that meant us as the end user were unable to sort of uh, be able to, to, to sort of manipulate that code uh, by implementing bug fixes or upgrades or, or just doing general maintenance uh, on, on that software. And that is why the open source community sort of emerged. It, 
it, it wanted the philosophy to allow people uh, or users to have the freedom to run, study, copy, distribute, and modify the software as they see best, uh, and, and also independently of the original developer. <clears throat> of course, as, we, as we've already sort of explored, that use of the open source software has now exploded yeah. around the world. And uh, we can see that it's prolifically used in almost all organizations around the world. So what I've observed through, through reading uh, around the Microsoft sort of reports is that they say 90% of all enterprises are deploying open source software in some form. And it is because of that statement that is why we're doing the work today, looking into those risks. This slide that you can actually see now, this is from the uh, 2021 Open Source Security and Risk Analysis Report produced by the Synopsis Cybersecurity Research Center. And it here, it clearly demonstrates sort of the ubiquity of open source software in all the various industry sectors that you can see here. You know, we can see that it's ranging from uh, the, the, the retail and e-commerce sector where 48% of their source code is open source, right through to sort of the cybersecurity and manufacturing sectors where we're now pushing upwards of 84% of the code base being open source. So it's this global usage of open source software and the very fact that it's embedded into the fabric of our lives, uh, that means from an organizational security perspective, we need to understand the risks that these open source software uh, sort of, sort of it, it poses on these organizations, on, on our organizations. And we, we need to make sure that we know how to use open source software in a compliant way. And to do that, we need to understand the risks. And we need to make sure that whatever we are doing from, from an organizational perspective, that we're not impacting on our other sort of cybersecurity and compliance requirements. So we can see that having an open source uh, compliant framework or, uh, and, and a strategy that uh, Gilles was talking about earlier, it allows us to demonstrate that we're following sort of the right steps and, and, and we're maintaining our internal and regulatory, maintaining compliance with our internal and regulatory sort of requirements. So what I want to do next is sort of focus in on, on sort of not only the development of open source uh, framework to, to, do, to, to assess the risks, but also to understand where those risks may exist. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a subtle difference between sort of security and compliance. Uh, securing an organization is all about understanding the risks and identifying adequate controls that can bring those risks down to an acceptable level. Now, Whichever framework you're using, you know, whether, whether it's 27,005 as, 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 as a way or 31,000, which is, which is sort of the, 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 the parent group that is driving us uh, to, to do this work, uh, the, we, 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 those frameworks can take a very descriptive approach to, to, to implementation. Whereas there are some compliance frameworks, and, and I use PCI DSS as an example, where they take a very prescriptive approach. And so they're telling you what you need to do, irrespective really of, of what the risks are that you're trying to manage. And so what I'm trying to say here is that being compliant does not always mean you are secure. So we've probably been working on this analysis probably for the last year or, two, or last two years when uh, under the guise as a study group within sort of the, the, the RM1 uh, BSI committee, uh, which, which we used in order to do an initial analysis on what we actually wanted, to, on what we wanted to focus on going forward. So based on this original work, um, I'm going to be looking at sort of four categories. I'll be looking at the development life cycle. Again, there are a number of risks which, which have been alluded to in, in the previous uh, 
dis discussions and, and presentations uh, where, where the development practices will be deployed by they can be different across different software project communities and there could also be you know right also sort of very different testing regimes uh, when, when they come to sort of assessing the the, the readiness of their artifacts uh, when they get sort of uh, ready for, 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 for use by, by, by an organization so as part of that development life cycle uh, we, we also need to take into account that there's an element of supply chain from, from the use of other open source projects which are embedded into, into, into that main uh, open source project that, that, that uh, we, we, we could be looking at. So there, there, there could be multiple layers uh, of, of open source components uh, within, within the project. And, and, and so, so this is where the, uh, the, the, the software bill of materials, the SBOM, comes into its own because that will provide some really sort of useful insight into what the components are of, of, of the, the, the overall open source program or project that, that we're looking at. We also want to be able to understand sort of the governance structure of the community or of the project that is developing the, the, that, that, the, the, the code. We talked about, or, or G, G, uh, G talk, talks about sort of the, the, the governance structure of an organization who is uh, sort of using open source, uh, uh, open source components. But, some, but we also need to understand what, what, what the governance structure is of these sort of communities that are not being run by large organizations. Because they will have, again, a, a level of risk that we need to understand. We'll be looking at sort of the assurance uh, categories uh, assessing how the open source components comply with the security tenets of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Plus, the ability for that project to demonstrate privacy by design as well as security by design and concepts. And, and, and we'll go through some privacy risks uh, later, later on in, in this presentation. So, all I do is I'm, I'm going to move on to the sort of the, the, the meat of this presentation. Uh, which is starting to look at the actual risks. So the, the sort of the first risk category uh, I, I want to look at is is, is around the development lifecycle. And the the, the, the first subcategory that I want to focus on is provenance of the project. So th this is really important to understand because an open source community or, 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 the, or the team behind the artifact or, or, or the code, uh, when being used by an organization, uh, an enterprise, they want to be able to understand what that history is. And do they have a good story of their problems, i.e., what was their origin in their history? Did it start as a side project, uh, maintained by, uh, at best, by, by best endeavors, um, with only one single developer who was working on the project, uh, sort of, in his spare time, uh, right, right through to is is this now a, a a large project with multiple developers and and, and full time sponsorship from from a, from a large organization where the, the code is being managed in, in, in a very efficient and, and uh, formal way, and we're, and we're able to monitor the progress of future implementations or understand how how the bugs are being fixed. And so all that, that's the provenance that we need to understand. And so the risk of uh, the provenance, uh, in particular to, to, to open source projects where it may have a weak or a limited provenance, is that it may not be suitable for meeting enterprise level risks, whether that's security or from a privacy perspective. So the risk of a weak or a limited provenance could be that the development of the artifact, the artifact might actually stop development because of lack of time or lack of interest from the developer. And so that results in unmaintained and unmaintainable code. And that's a big risk to an enterprise. So the next category or subcategory is around technical development. 
And, and we can break this down into sort of three areas. We can look at where the security issues and the vulnerabilities remain unaddressed. And I call that code vulnerability. Uh, and, and, and the code vulnerability, where the time extends and becomes greater and greater where, from the actual maintenance of the, um, of, of, of the code, uh, especially if there is a, a CVE, a common vulnerability exposure, that has been assigned to that code, then it becomes uh, a, a, a major sort of, sort of risk to the organization. So the, the, the enterprise ready solutions need to, where there are enterprise ready solutions, these organizations will have service level agreements with, 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 the, uh, with, with the project. But if that project is, is sort of a community project, then they may not have those SLAs. And so here the risk is that an organization could end up with vulnerable code that has not been maintained sort of in a, in a timely manner. that there was a comment. Ah, yeah, so the, the question here is that um, are these specific to open source or are they uh, general to, to software uh, as a whole? And uh, yes, they do apply to both levels, but what we want to do uh, is, is take into account sort of the areas that we're talking about now and be able to, 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 to extract out further for, for the purposes of the standard, extract out the, the specific open source um, uh, risks that, 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 that relates to uh, an organization using open source risks, like open source software. So if we, if we move on to sort of the te technology support, which is the, uh, the, the, the second area, it's aligned with the provenance and code development. Uh, again, the community may have a small development team, and the risk here is that with the lack of enterprise and ready technical support, that, communi that community may not have the ability to implement enterprise-grade development lifecycle controls. And, and that could potentially res uh, result in a lack of code and testing standards, and ultimately in misconfigurations with the design of vulnerabilities or the code itself. And accordingly, it becomes the responsibility of the organization who is bringing that code into, uh, in, into use to then be able to assess if they need to provide additional engineers or for oversight, supervision, and troubleshooting. Now, for instance, for instance if the code doesn't completely fit uh, the organizational use case, then they will need, then that organization will need to bring in house uh, engineers that can make the modifications to find uh, the answer to those solutions uh, or, or if there are any bugs then to be able to fix those bugs. So this could then sort of force non-technical focused organizations, i.e. those which don't have a development team, to then become very heavily reliant on uh, a, a third party uh, solution. So the, the, that, that third party solution will could be like Red Hat, where, where its business model is supporting the open source sort of code in an enterprise environment. But then the sort of the distribution channel, which, which is the, the last area within sort of the technical development, a distribution channel is all about um, looking at how vulnerabilities could be sort of inserted into the code that's being developed uh, before it gets to the enterprise. And this, this is sort of the, that supply chain route. So it may be the case that the code is published uh, as, a, as a binary or, or the organization is downloading that binary. Um, and what the sort of the, the, the open source project has done is, is, is aligned a hash with that binary that's been downloaded. But what enterprises are not doing is comparing the hash with the binary that they downloaded and making sure that they are the same. And through that sort of failure in, 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 in that sort of governance aspect of comparing the hash with, with the binary, there is a chance that uh, a, a malicious organized or, or, or a malicious actor 
could make, make alterations to that binary, insert a malicious code, and the sort of the enterprise organization may not realize uh, that, that, that there has been that change, especially if they're not downloading it from the original source. So th th then there's sort of the, an another risk, which is uh, uh, where the, the source of the code and the source of the hash are from the same location. So if that website or, or that location gets compromised, the, the, the malicious actor could then sort of insert code into the binary and then update the hash to, 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 to then sort of fool uh, the, the, the enterprise organization uh, in, in believing that, it, that there is a genuine, uh, that the, the, the code is originated from the genuine source. And, and, and that is why, you know, a lot, lot, lot of uh, people are saying that we should build from the source code rather than use a binary that's sitting up uh, alongside the, the, the source code uh, produced by, by those, the, the open source project. There could be a lack of governance, which, which is sort of the next category I want to look at. Uh, a lack of governance overseeing the management of the actual open source community itself. Uh, you know, by, by default, there is an implicit high level of trust within the open source community by the way it's just evolved. And those community members rely on individual achievement <coughs> of, of the project rather than specifically the, the identity of the developer. So a community member could have developed a sufficient history in, 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 in working with that project uh, that to, to such a degree that they actually now become a primary maintainer. But the issue there is that that, that maintainer has never actually been verified other than via an email address, because that is their only source of identification. So again, we can look at the risks there, which could be that the first one being uh, for, from the lack of governance and structure, that they're, they're, they may not actually have the good security controls in place uh, and, and will sort of prevent uh, that, uh, pre prevent sort of the good controls around the development life cycle. Um, <clears throat> because that maintainer who, who has not been identified or validated uh, actually has their email account compromised and the malicious actor then imposes themselves as pretending to be that maintainer and, and therefore starts to compromise the, 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 the source code, inserting malicious, com, uh, malicious code or malicious, malicious libraries. And because there's been no validation from, from, from the, the sort of imposed by the governance of the, the, the open source project, that is why uh, the, the malicious actor has been able to sort of uh, compromise that account. And the, and the enterprise organization would be none the wiser. And then if we look at the software bill of materials, as we mentioned before, now this is, this is a mechanism to be able to identify the software components that make up a larger open source project. And it captures sort of the metadata, such as the licenses of the components. Now there is a standard, the SPDX standard, which is an example of, of, of a way of capturing the, the, the SBOM information, where it's covering components that are in use, the licenses, the copyrights, and the security references. And, and, and it has a common format that allows companies and communities to share the importance of that data, sort of in the streamlined and uh, improved way uh, by being able to identify and, and monitor that software through, through the SBOM. And the SBOM can also be used to support license compliance, as, as uh, it can be used to support security and export controls. And, and, and the broader processes, you know, even, even as far as uh, sort of mergers and acquisitions and, and uh, or venture capital investments. So it has a, it has a really sort of uh, good value in, in, in what it can offer. But the risk of not using an SBOM means that there might be a lack of knowledge or understanding of all the underlying software components that are contained in a larger open source uh, sort of artifact. Uh, the, the, the organization who is using that open source code may not be aware uh, that 
there are vulnerable libraries within within the artifact. Uh, they, which are being sort of uh, sort of uh, in, in, ingested from, from earlier on down or, or downstream of that open source project. And and, and another risk from not using S bonds is the fact that the incorrect licensing could be in use. And, and that may open up the organization to what I, what I would call a copy left intellectual property predator who, are, who, who can then go around and start suing organizations who are using these, these uh, uh, who are using these open source components, but not uh, using them correctly by, by not having the, the, the right sort of references back to the originating source, for example. Uh, I suppose at this point it's worth saying that the, the SPDX is uh, a de facto standard and it does actually have its own um, ISO, uh, ISO standards. Uh, yeah, yes, you're correct. Uh, Joey, that is the point of open chain with, 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 with the ISO 5230. Um, but not all organizations will be aware, not all enterprise organizations will be aware of, of, of those standards. And, and, and the SPDX standard is, is the ISO 5962, for those of you who are interested. So I'm going to move on to the sort of the, the, the operational risk scenarios that an organization might face when using open source software. Uh, and this is around sort of the, the versioning of software when it's deployed throughout the organization, um, uh, making sure that uh, we're using sort of the latest versions, uh, and making sure that staff are using the latest versions. And, and just like commercial software, a good open source project will evolve and become, uh, we, we, we'll have many more uh, contributors from the community sort of continuously improving that software. And so the versioning risk is, is, is making sure the organization is using the latest versions, uh, making sure that they're deployed uh, throughout the, the, the enterprise. Because there could be known vulnerabilities in the earlier versions, which which others might be using, and absolutely the 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 the, 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 Jerry, the, the, the CDA database is exactly what uh, is is our friend in this case, and and we can use the S bomb to to correlate uh, with, with with those situations. Another another factor about um, sort of a uh, version proliferation is is that open source might be used by different teams. And, and they, they could end up using what they think is the same uh, open source project, but using different versions of that project. And so what you, what you now end up is, is, is uh, sort of different risks within uh, different teams because they're not using standardized uh, sort of, and, and a standardized approach and the latest um, versions of the software. And so this is this, this again all maps back into the governance of, of, of how an enterprise was managing their open source software. <clears throat> so another key factor uh, within the operational risk is sort of understanding project activity. And I think this is this is this is a key one. And, and this is where an enterprise can assess how well the project is being maintained. We, this, this activity will relate to sort of the types of commits that are being implemented uh, and you know are those commits from a security perspective or are they for uh, adding in new features and when was the last time that they committed because what 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 you don't want to do is is, is end up using an open source component that's coming from a project that is actually no longer active you, you want a project that is active vibrant uh, with, with lots of sort of input and a lot of discussion, people working on it, because you know that way they're, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a greater chance of finding vulnerabilities and having those fixes issued before other sort of malicious people have identified those vulnerabilities and taken advantage and exploited them. So the project activity risk in organisation is that that open source project is no longer active, which is no longer being implemented, improved, and it's no longer being maintained. And the organization is then left with the issue of how to fix any vulnerabilities or any issues that are identified. And that becomes extremely difficult for any developer 
of, of, of the enterprise if they've never been involved in developing that original source code or that that, that, pro, that open source project actually has poor governance in place. So what I'll do now is I'm going to sort of look at the privacy risks associated with open source. And, you know, making sure that open source uh, artifacts actually have privacy by design as well as security by, des by design principles built into it. So the following sort of the key privacy risks that I've sort of identified and, and be working on further to, 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 do, to develop, uh, especially in the work that we're doing. An organization should assess any open source component, especially those that have access or, or can be configured to have access to personal data or sensitive personal data. And so therefore they need to ensure that there is there's the, 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 the risk from a, from a cybersecurity compromise resulting in a data breach impacting privacy of, of, the, uh, the, of, of, the, of the of the subject has been minimized. And perhaps ways around doing this is that, uh, or, 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 or sorry, or the risks from why an open source project may not understand or what, 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 what data that could be captured by their own uh, uh, software is the fact that perhaps they haven't defined the taxonomy, which then allows them to classify personal data within uh, the project. Perhaps they're not also uh, not understanding that they are collecting personal data in certain contexts. Uh, and, and, and so they, they've not really assessed the design from a privacy perspective. And so therefore the risk to the enterprise is that that open source artifact may be, uh, they may not be fully aware of what personal sensitive person uh, uh, sensitive personal data is actually been captured and stored within the artifact and within the software. And so the, the, the organization may not even be aware that this open source software component has collected personally identifiable information. So the next risk that I'm going to look at is, 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 is around the fact that access control may not have been designed or and implemented correctly into uh, the, the, the software. <coughs> and so the, the, the correct permissions and the rights and, and the privileges of the user are not being implemented uh, correctly. And this aligns with the earlier risk around understanding what data is being collected. And therefore the risk here is that there, there's a lack of poor design and poor implementation to protect the personal data, which could then lead to an inappropriate lack of, sort of immutable logging and monitoring as well. And, and that, that, that could impact on the ability to demonstrate auditing requirements uh, associated with the access control. Another area would be around sort of visibility and transparency that relates to the way the community demonstrates how their software development lifecycle uh, utilizes tools and processes to demonstrate appropriate security and privacy controls. And then this allows the project to demonstrate sort of, you know, their, their seriousness to, 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 to managing the, the, the privacy aspect. But there, there is a risk that the open source project does not identify and document the privacy requirements or implement policies and processes, and, and they fail to address the privacy requirements during all stages of the life cycle. And, and they're not transparent around sort of their development processes. And, 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 and this then brings in the risk of not understanding and documenting the data flows. Or, or understanding where the data is stored, processed, or transmitted. And so ultimately, the risk to the enterprise is that the privacy requirements of personal data stored in, this, in these open source artifacts are not adequately protected. And, and, and like any uh, uh, software implementation, there, there should be a threat model uh, which, which is uh, implemented uh, so that you, you, you can identify where potential vulnerabilities may exist. Again, that's, that's, that's no different from, from whether it's a closed source or an open source. But the risk to the organization, if the open source project has not sort of implemented a threat modeling process in their development life cycle, uh, means that there could be an inadequate set of security controls uh, developed into the, the actual open source code. And then sort of the final category that I want to just quickly talk about is the, 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 the concept of consent in an open source project. A, a, a lot of 
privacy by design is about ensuring that a, a project uh, or ensuring that the project is aware that personal data has been collected and that they have a mechanism in place to actually consent to the pro to, or allow the end user to consent to the process of having their data collected. And you know, that, that, therefore, an open source software project should implement a consent framework within the, their code. I am aware that there is a tool out there, an open source tool out there, that can help manage that fine grain sort of data protection policy tool, tool set to validate the various data types that are in place. I, 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 top of my head, I just can't remember the name. But the risk to the organization is that an open source artifact could end up collecting personal data that the user has not actively consented to. And, and so, you, you know, that ultimately means that an organization, an enterprise organization, could actually be in breach of certain regulations, you know, especially the GDPR. So based on the risks I've just mentioned, uh, and, and the many sources of security, that there are many security and compliance teams within enterprises that still have this pessimistic view when, 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 when using open source code. And, and we, we can probably align that view with the same approach that organizations took in the early adoption days of, of, of cloud computing. It's, it's sort of the same issues. But we don't need, to, or an, an enterprise organization doesn't need to be pessimistic. And you know, with appropriate assurances and, 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 and good open source compliance frameworks in place, we can start to sort of reduce those risks and demonstrate that it's actually okay to use open source software. And the organization should be able to create sort of a, a well, the enterprise should be able to create a clear approach to that governance. Which again, uh, as you mentioned earlier, but in the absence of standards and central governance, uh, open source software could, could appear to be sort of like a grey controlled area from a security point of view. And, and again, you know, the, the, the enterprise should be considering zero trust models in this context to, to, act, to support the use of open source code. Uh, because what we don't want to be doing is bringing vulnerabilities into the organisation. And, and again, you know, we, we should look at carrying out maturity assessments to evaluate sort of the, the, the controls around the open source operations and activities. And, and that risk there, if, you, if you're not implementing assurance activities, is that you could end up implementing open source software in an insecure way, which could then lead to all, all the previously mentioned risks being realized and ultimately uh, sort of a major security or privacy breach or incident occurring. So to conclude around sort of the that this this initial sort of uh, di discussion around sort of the risks associated with open source and how we want to start to apply this to a a, a, a standard to support uh, the 27001 uh, ISMS framework. Um, what what we're currently doing is is is, is we, we pulled together a, a group between the two uh, committees that I mentioned earlier, RM1 and IST33, and we're looking at uh, that we've been sort of dis discussing what the scope is. And so far, we, we've agreed that the scope should be around providing guidance for an organization to an enterprise to recognize and understand the security risks and the potential impacts associated with using an open source project covering sort of the development life cycle, the implementations, the testing uh, and the maintenance and sort of the associated open source software supply chain. We want to be able to provide a repeatable and consistent approach to improving the identification and uh, the, the, the consequences of using open source software. Uh, and this will then allow us to provide the, the right support and context to an organization uh, especially when, when they uh, will allow us to support the existing ISMSs that these organizations may have. So the aim is to make the document will also be applicable to all types and sizes of organizations, you know, whether it's private, public, government entity or not for profit. So I'll, I'll just conclude on that by saying that if anyone is interested in joining our ad hoc working group, then as I mentioned, please feel free to contact me or, or Probably easier to get in touch with Reza.
uh, who, who then who, who's also actively working with me on this project. So thanks very much for your time, and uh, I guess I'll open up for questions if you've got time for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there any questions? Okay, no? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, MJ. Jeremy, can we close the session? Uh, yes, we can. Um, um, I, I will do the shutting down. You don't have to do anything. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much for our speakers. And um, uh, I will, I'll close the session and Julian, probably tomorrow night, because it's getting a bit late in Germany, um, we'll um, get all the videos. But uh, three interesting talks. And uh, Sinjin, I hope you might don't mind my fairly active engagement. It's an area I'm very right. care a lot, a lot, as you can <laughs> see. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we, as you said, we're, we're still at the early stages. So it, it, it's, it's yes, right now there are a lot of similarities between closed source and open source in, in, in the risks that we're doing. And what we do want to do is extract out the, the, the pertinent ones that are associated with open source. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. Three good talks. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.